The origin of Lecco is a Polish word, which means light and easy. And that really, I think, embodied how we want the tooling to feel for engineering teams. It should be very easy, straightforward, and simple to use, and really help teams get things out there faster, be nice and light to get things out there. This is your Sapin Bhartia, and welcome to your Let's Talk. Today we have with us Conrad Niemitz, CEO and founder of Leco. Conrad, it's great to have you on the show. Thank you so much, Flop. Great to be here. It's my pleasure to host you here, and you folks uh, are coming out of stealth, uh, so there are a lot to talk about, but I will start with the very foundational question, which is, what is Leco all about? What problem do you guys see in the modern world where we see that, hey, most of the problems are always solved, so what problem do you still see that needs to be solved, which led to the creation of this company? Leco is a developer tool primarily, but it's for any company that builds software and has software as part of its product. And the goal is to make that software dynamic and in the face of a world that's imperfect and it's tough to ship things fast. Uh, and a lot of the problems that we see are actually in contrast to a lot of tools on the market um, in the feature flagging space. Uh, feature flagging is a technique that has been around for a few years where you guard new feature releases using a flag. And we've really seen that, I felt that feature flagging tooling out there on the market has really fallen short for engineering teams. Uh, it has too, too tough of a trade-off between moving fast and getting features out to customers, as well as the risks and complexities associated with implementing feature flagging correctly. And I originally worked at Uber for a few years on the self-driving team, and I saw a class of tooling that a lot of big tech companies pioneered over the last 10 years called dynamic configuration. And it was used to customize Uber in all sorts of different cities, in 10,000 cities across the world. And when I used the current feature flagging tools after I left, I worked at a smaller startup. I really felt like I missed that tooling that I had at Uber and wanted to bring it to every team that doesn't have the resources that Uber, Google, or Facebook have. Now I want to go a bit detail just for the sake of our audience to understand uh, these practices. What is feature flagging? So feature flagging as a practice separates code deployment from feature release. So if you think about it in a, a CD-ROM software world, you would ship an updated release every six months or maybe a year. But nowadays, deploys, especially in a cloud, uh, cloud computing world, deploys are happening really fast, maybe even multiple times a day at some companies. And the idea would be if you are shipping out new code every few hours or every six hours, you might not want to be releasing features at the same time as you release code. So the idea of feature flagging is to have a flag in your code, an external source of truth that says, hey, this will be on or off um, for a certain percentage of users maybe, or for certain customers. And that's controlled independently of the deploy. So you have a separate system that says, hey, actually right now, even though I deployed six hours ago, I'm gonna turn that new code on. And if there's an issue, I can very quickly roll that back. So if you look at modern CI CD tools, when you talk about you know, the frequent you know, deployments, don't they take care of feature flagging efficiently? CI CD tools are in charge of helping you get your code out there safely into the world, but often you're operating with incomplete information, right? So you may have some good tests, but you might not have the right integration test, or you might not have perfect production data. So at the end of the day, situations in production are not gonna exactly match testing. So CICD does a great job of getting things out to production, but managing your code when it's already out there in the world is where feature flagging really comes in and shines. And as you were uh, giving the example of Uber, uh, how mature and well established is uh, the feature flagging practice? And is it more of a practice or is it more of tools? Definitely. So feature flagging as a practice is incredibly well established at Uber. It has been around since I believe around 2015 or 2016. Um, and they have this, the tooling, however, is a dynamic configuration tool. And the creator of that tool, which is called Flipper, F-L-I-P-R, 
you can find multiple blog posts on it on Uber's engineering blog. Uh, we have the creator of the library actually as an angel investor in Leco, uh, Thomas Chen, who's, who's an incredible engineer and incredible leader. And um, that system allowed Uber to not only feature flag, but also decrease the risks and complexities associated with feature flagging. They have very extensive uh, integration testing, canary testing, and reviews um, alongside that feature flagging practice in order to make this dynamic configuration system work well. And that final step is teams on the ground in all these different cities can actually define the product configuration, which is where kind of the configuration piece comes from. And they can define how each city's instance of Uber essentially runs. And they have the right to make those changes um, without taking down the system. So people outside of the engineering team, the operations teams are able to modify, like feature flag and uh, change things in the product configuration without causing issues. Excellent, thank you. Uh, now I want to talk a bit about your unique approach also based on your experience at Uber uh, for feature flagging. And if I'm not wrong, Leco, as before interview started, we we're talking about the name itself is from Polish origin and it does have a meaning also, which is associated with feature flagging also. So let's talk about the, the origin of the name and then your approach towards feature flagging. The origin of Leco is a Polish word, which means light and easy. And that really, I think, embodied how we want the tooling to feel for engineering teams. It should be very easy, straightforward, and simple to use, and really help teams get things out there faster, be nice and light to get things out there. And in terms of the differences compared to current feature flagging tools today, we really see two main differences for engineering teams. The first one being our in-code approach. So rather than defining a feature flag in an external system, engineers can decorate and wrap their functions so that their definitions can be dynamic, can be updated at runtime. And that allows for very great developer experience. It's very reproducible and very simple. It's easy to understand and easy to fetch definitions of those functions to reproduce issues. And the second difference is our tooling is hyper-focused on issue prevention. So we have some obvious techniques to software engineers, which often is not associated with feature flagging when it comes to static typing, when it comes to running configuration and feature flagging changes through CI and CD in terms of defining validation so that certain combinations can't be together. And then we also have uh, an AI approach where we're integrating a lot of the latest LLMs and pioneering some techniques to examine your code and proactively find invalid configurations of, let's say, multiple feature flags together, or actively detect issues by estimating the impact of a change. If an ops person is intending on changing something for one customer and they end up changing things for every single customer, we can proactively detect those sort of changes. So we think that those two big differences for engineering teams will flip the scripts and really make it so that um, teams won't have this trade-off of the risk and complexity. And this is something that we, we want the approach of engineers to be like we saw at big tech companies. Uh, at Uber and at Facebook, uh, one of our founding engineers was a tech lead of this kind of tooling at Facebook called Configurator. And we really want the approach of the engineering team to be like it was at a big tech company and use it by default because they don't have this downside of the trade-off. And the final difference is because this downside isn't there, the use of things like feature flagging, we think can graduate to define the configuration of the product. So that means that you know, it's when you have 10 feature flags, instead of having 1,024 combinations you know, on or off, two to the 10th is 1,024 combinations. Um, you can actually define, actually only 10 of those configurations are valid for my product. So what that means is it's significantly easier for users to test, for uh, the business to actually avoid untested code slipping to customers, less outages, but also protecting the customer experience so that you can have better growth, better retention, 
and eventually increase revenue for the company. You also mentioned earlier uh, dynamic configuration. Talk about what it is and how it works with feature flagging. Yes, yeah, so we think that feature flagging as a technique is a subset of dynamic configuration. So dynamic configuration is this approach to feature flagging where the tooling is very focused on engineers and very focused on issue prevention. Um, we borrowed this idea of an in-code approach from Facebook. Um, they had a, we think that our implementation will work for a lot of different companies. And we really see that over time, these large organizations, Uber, Google, Facebook, uh, Plaid, Grubhub, a few others, DoorDash, all end up building very similar tools as they scale. So they might start off with some basic feature flagging tooling, but they see the similar downside of the risk and the complexity that's associated. So they eventually build a very similar dynamic configuration system. And we hope that um, teams that start off with their own or a third party feature flagging tool won't have to make the same mistakes that all these companies did in order to build this sophisticated dynamic configuration system. And we can give them that power without the kind of risk and complexity. How well established are these practices where you're like, these practices are always in place and LECO is more or less like empowering, enabling those teams with the, with, you know, its capabilities? Or do you feel that there is some awareness needed for companies to understand uh, about these practices? I think two questions there, right? How well established is this? And kind of, is there an education piece needed, right? I think it, large tech companies, you know, FANG plus, uh, if you want to include Uber in that acronym, this has been a well-established practice. Uh, Facebook's paper on holistic configuration management was released, I believe, in 2014. So it's been around for quite some time. And at large tech companies, this is a well-established practice. But for every other software team on the market, maybe without the resources of an Uber and a Google, those practices are not as well established. Feature flagging is now becoming an early mainstream way of releasing features. But we really think that a lot of teams feel these problems that we're describing. The first one that really resonates with teams is you know, stale feature flags that are left around uh, and people flipping flags and causing issues that engineers end up getting blamed for when their operations or customer success or product person is just trying to do their job and make sure that the software is correct for their customer or their region or whatever that looks like. So people are very familiar, I believe, with the problems of feature flagging. So that I think needs less education, but education around the solution and how dynamic configuration is the solution is something that we're going to be doing as we release our product and show how we're really helping some of our early customers solve these problems. Awesome, and I wanna talk a bit of the company now. You folks just came out of stealth Talk a bit about uh, the plans, the immediate plans that you have for the company. Talk about the investors' investment. So we're partnering with some great folks. Uh, Addition and Lux are our lead investors who are really excited about investing in software infrastructure companies, which will really change how people build software. And both companies also are very excited about taking techniques from large tech companies and democratizing those. So they're really focused on those kinds of investments. So it was a great match for us, um, as well as with help from SV Angel, Box Group, Abstraction, and a few others. And in terms of our immediate plans, we're really excited this week to launch our free forever plan. So any engineer can go in, sign up, and feel what dynamic configuration is like in their code. We have a very easy setup, should be under half an hour, and you're up and running with dynamic code, which should be very exciting. And in terms of our next six months, we're really excited to release our team plan later on this year. We're working with some early design partners, some uh, guide customers right now to really show how we can solve more and more of those problems that I described, more and more of that risk and complexity being reduced for engineering teams and afterwards making the business feel that benefit by defining the allowed configurations of products. So that's what we're looking at later this year. Conrad, thank you so much for taking time out today to talk about Lego. Uh, I mean, as you said, this there's so much to talk about. So we, we covered as much as we could in this interview, but I really look forward to chatting with you again as the company grows, as the company evolves, as 
the ecosystem evolves. So I look forward to uh, talking to you again, but I really appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thank you, Swap. Really excited to chat again and hope some folks can get in and try out what we have to offer.